statesmanship will not be rewarded. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer the Prime Minister to his statement in the House yesterday that government debt will peak at $300 billion. I also refer him to the Treasurer's statement minutes later that government debt will reach $315 billion. Can the Prime Minister inform the House whether public debt will peak $15 billion higher than he advised the House yesterday. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, gross public debt peaks at um, 300 uh, because that is tw 300 billion. Order! 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 The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, as I said to the House yesterday, uh, public debt, uh, gross public Order. debt. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. Question having been asked, I would have thought members would be interested in the answer. The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, I thank the honourable member for his question. Gross public debt peaks, as I advised the House yesterday, at around 300 billion, which is 21.7 per cent. 21.7 per cent of uh, GDP. Uh, when it uh, rises in aggregate terms to 315 billion. That's 21.4 per cent of GDP. Uh, as I advised the House yesterday, therefore, peaking is at 21.7 per cent of GDP, which is around 300 billion. Oh, the member for Karangamite. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister, how is the government building Australia out of recession and laying the foundations for recovery from the global recession? for its nation-building agenda. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for Karangamite for his question, because he, like various members of this House, is proud of the government's nation-building strategy for recovery. Um, our nation-building strategy for recovery involves construction of infrastructure right across Australia, including in Karangamite, and including in various of those seats which were referred to in this House yesterday, where it seems that honourable members from benches opposite were pleased to attend local launch ceremonies while in this chamber pretending that they did not support the measures through the House Member which gave Casey. funding for those local launch ceremonies of infrastructure. Well, I'm surprised by that. Mr Speaker, under the Nation Building for Recovery Plan, there are 115 projects underway in the members' electorate at a cost of $49 million. These include 87 projects under the largest school modernisation program in Australia's history across 72 schools in the Karangamite electorate. There are 18 social housing units being built. There are 10 projects under Order. the government's Black Spots and Boomgates program, including $510,000 in Black Spot funding for the Princess Highway West in Belmont, uh, $6 million to five local councils under the Community Infrastructure Program, including $2 million towards wide-ranging sports facility at Bannockburn, which will include new netball, football, soccer and tennis facilities for young families moving into the area. These projects are supporting jobs and small businesses in suburbs like Ocean Grove, Torquay, Grovedale and Colac. This is part of the government's Nation Building for Recovery plan, supporting jobs, small business and apprenticeships for today, while building the infrastructure Australia needs for tomorrow. Mr Speaker, if the Liberals had their way in this House, not a single one of these 115 projects would have ever seen the light of day. Not a single, not a single school would be upgraded, not a single black spot would be repaired, no social housing. The contrast with those opposite is clear for all to see. Right across the nation, however, Mr Speaker, we have the same construction work underway. Investment supporting 200,000 jobs next year and the year after. And this is being done through the vehicle of investing in 35,000 projects across the country by year's end. 35,000. Let's just take a few of these as an example, because those opposite need to be put up close and personal with what's actually going on around the country. 
Kuta Mantra to Parks Railway upgrade. Have a look at this one. This photo shows the first of 301,000 new concrete sleepers being unloaded near parks Prime to will commence the Kuta Mantra to. Prime Minister will resume his seat. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Prime Minister will resume his seat. Member for Leichhardt. The manager of opposition business with a point of order. Mr Speaker, the rules with respect to props are very clear. The Prime Minister has a whole stack of these uh, the hard hat manager photographs he wants to the shop to the House and I ask you to not do So you're not interested in a response to your point of order? There is no point of order, and the honourable member for Sturt knows it quite well. The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, to the great disappointment of those opposite, members on this House will be attending ceremonies right across the country, also making sure that these projects are being rolled out right across the country. Ministers will be attending in each one of the electorates represented by those right across the country because each of these projects equals jobs, equals infrastructure, equals our nation building strategy for recovery. Mr. Speaker, Seymour Albury rail upgrade. Now, here we go. This photo shows concrete resleepering work being done in the Seymour to Wodonga rail project. I assume that the relevant local members are not interested in this. Work will involve Prime the laying Minister. of around 225,000 sleepers to complete an upgrade Prime of the Minister. Melbourne to Sydney corridor, which has seen the laying of over one million new concrete sleepers. Mr Speaker, this again is about nation building for recovery. Now, let's see those opposite uh, laugh and sneer about this. Here we have defence housing in Brisbane. Prime Minister. This is a housing site in Brisbane Prime where 41 Minister. new defence homes are Prime already Minister. under construction. Prime Minister, resume his seat. The member for McCullough will resume her seat. Order. Order. The member for Sturt is warned. The member for Oxley. There's, there's no need for any encouragement. The member for O'Connor on a point of order. Yes, on the matter of precedent of this particular display, is it now permissible for the opposition to come out in here tomorrow with cardboard cutouts? of the Prime Minister in his jacket and hard hat. The member for O'Connor will resume his seat. Prime Minister has the call. <laughs> oh, the great thing about Wilson, he's always on song. The, Prime um, Minister. Um, and, and for Wilson's benefit in the uh, seat of O'Connor, 265 projects at a value of 37.3 million. <laughs> And perhaps the member for O'Connor would care to identify which in his particular electorate he would not wish to proceed. Which of the schools would he prefer not to have upgraded? I'm surprised, Mr. Speaker. He's normally so quick to his feet. Gone silent. That's the way. Nothing. Nothing. What about the social housing Order. units being constructed? Prime Black Minister. Spot and Boomgate projects. There's 19 in the electorate of O'Connor. 5.9 million. You don't want none of the 23 Boomgates. Is that correct? Six million dollars for 48 local councils. Wants none of that. Order. I see surprising silence on the part of the member for O'Connor. Now, Mr. Speaker, defence housing, near and dear to the heart of those opposite, near and dear to the heart of those in the government. Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Mackellar on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time and, again, <clears throat> time and again, you and other speakers have ruled out of order the use of props. Why is there an exception on the part of the Prime Minister? And will you rule them out of order? Order. From time to time, prime, uh, speakers have ruled the use of props in order. If it's used incidentally to the question.
Order. This um, is an opportunity for me to indicate that when I hear the um, interjection of, of use of a PowerPoint, that it would be a wonderful thing if this chamber was so mature that it could actually use things like PowerPoints, photos, and that would be enabled for everybody. But I think that one of the problems is that, again, we have this insider's view of uh, the way in which the chamber operates. We don't often reflect upon how we are looked upon from outside. I will watch carefully the use of these, these props, but to say that they have been blanketly, blanketly banned is an incorrect observation of the way in which this place has operated. The Prime Minister. David, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, he's, he's made These are the great moments of state. <laughs> Trust you to rise to them. Well, my the member for Hume has a very great habit of making comments by way of interjection on 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 um, the speaker, and I think that the one the reference that he is making well and truly, he understands, was deserving of the action that was taken on, the, on that fateful day of last year. I will listen to the manager of opposition business, but he should understand that this will not be an occasion to abuse the opportunity that he has in actually speaking to a point of order, which I've already ruled on. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the member for McKellar raised a point of order which you have quite correctly ruled on from your opinion of the standing orders. The, you did, however, in doing so, say that the standing orders said that props were entitled to be used incidentally to the question. But the Prime, I would put it to you, with due respect, the Prime Minister is not using these props incidentally. They form the major part of the answer to his question, which has now been going for almost eight minutes. And I would ask, if, if you expect the House right. to, to, to maintain the its decorum— seat. The member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. I thank him for his observation. It will not dissuade me from my ruling. And I will just add another observation. Of the eight minutes that this question has been going on, only five minutes of them have been an answer. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for McKellar for intervention. As given that she's wearing her own high visibility vest today, she's obviously entering into the spirit of the occasion in terms of launching infrastructure projects across the nation. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, also, the, member, the uh, manager of opposition business, the electorate of Sturt. 82 projects worth an investment of $40 million. Perhaps the member for Sturt, given he comes to the dispatch box so frequently, could identify which of those 82 projects he would not wish to support. 82 projects in 48 schools. Which of those schools? $34.5 million into the schools in Sturt. These are funding under the February package, Building the Education Revolution, which those opposite are supporting or opposing. It's hard to work out. What about the $4 million uh, for the Campbelltown Public Library redevelopment? Supporting or opposing? Order. Hmm. Order. Interesting silence again on the part Order. of both the member for Sturt, surprisingly, and for the member for O'Connor, equally surprisingly. Uh, to manage your opposition business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, previously you have said, you have ruled that the Prime Minister, in asking members of the opposition to answer questions, knows that they are not entitled to do so, and you have said the Prime Minister should des desist from doing so the last time this occurred. Right. He's doing it again right. today. Right. If, the if he wants to be able to give Sturt us the facility to answer seat. questions— The member for Sturt will resume his seat. Or the member for Longman. The member for Longman. <laughs> Prime Minister has the call. Oh, Mr. Speaker, how sensitive they are about infrastructure construction. As I would say to those 
those opposite, each one of these 35,000 projects across the nation will member be there for participating in each of them, including in those electorates where the local members are pretending they are not supporting them. Mr Speaker, defence housing. I hold up this a particular illustration of 41 new defence homes already under construction. Just two months have elapsed between the announcement of the stimulus plan and the start of construction of these homes. Prime Minister. Defence housing authority Defence Housing Authority is being provided with 251 million. Prime Minister, I think the members have got the picture. The Prime Minister, in continuation. 251 oh. million in funding. Uh, Prime these Minister, resume his seat. Prime Minister, resume his seat. Member for Canning should be very careful because that is, he should not think that anything has been said is a precedent for that type of behaviour. The You want to get the call or what? The, the people just around the place raising signs. All right, you know. The member for Patterson on a point of order. On a point of order, and it's relevance, Mr. Speaker. If he's going to show photos, he could at least show ones with him in there wearing the hard hat. The member for Patterson may leave the chamber for one hour under 94A. No, the manager of opposition business can resume his seat. The manager of opposition business can resume his seat. The manager of opposition is named. Leader of the House. I move that the member be suspended from the services of the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Vision required, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Point the honourable members for Shortland and Werriwa tell us for the eyes, members for Riverina and Ryan tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is ayes 80, no 63. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The member for Sturt is therefore suspended for 24 hours. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Therefore, the government's uh, strategy, nation building to recovery, is clear. Supporting jobs, supporting small business, supporting apprenticeships right across the nation today by investing in the infrastructure we need for tomorrow. That's why we're taking strong and decisive action to achieve this on the ground. Infrastructure like rail, like road, like ports, broadband, solar energy and the biggest school modernisation program in Australia's history. Investment that supports more than 200,000 jobs that would otherwise be destroyed as a consequence of the recession. Mr Speaker, the government has rightly stepped in to fill the gap left by a private sector in retreat because of the global economic recession. Mr Speaker, the government has rightly decided to invest 70 per cent of its stimulus in nation-building infrastructure. This is a strategy for the future. It is a positive strategy for the future, a government which is in the business of building the economy up rather than opposition seeking to tear and tilt the economy down. Order. Just before giving the call to the leader, the, the member for Solomon. Order. I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Minister for Housing and Fisheries, Philip Heatley, from New Zealand. I offer him, on behalf of members, a warm welcome. I just le leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer the Prime Minister to his statement yesterday that in 2020 his government will have left the country with a net debt liability of $75 billion. Will the Prime Minister inform the House 
in which year his temporary debt will be finally paid off. The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm advised by the Treasury within about two years of that time. The Member for Dobell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House the reactions from industry and market economists to the budget's emphasis on nation building infrastructure? The Treasurer. Yes, I thank the Member for Dobell for his question because there are something like 74 projects underway in Dobell, 54 school projects. Isn't that tremendous? It certainly has the support of this side of the House because these projects are supporting jobs, they're supporting small businesses on the central coast of New South Wales. And of course, they are a central part of our nation building plans for recovery. And of course, if those opposite had their way, not one of those 74 projects would ever see the light of day. Because what we see in these projects is economic stimulus in action, supporting jobs in local communities, supporting small business in local communities, making up for the fact that private demand has withdrawn. That's what economic stimulus is all about. And that is what the budget has been about, phase three of economic stimulus. Phase one last year, cash to cash constrained consumers to boost demand, to boost employment, particularly in retail. And of course, then again in February, our nation building plans for investment in schools, for investment in energy efficiency, for investment in social housing, economic stimulus for jobs in action, nation building for recovery. And that is why this program has had the support of the business community. If I could just quote from Peter Anderson, Chief Executive of the Australian Chamber of Commerce. The investment is overdue and will contribute to a more efficient and competitive economy when recovery comes. That's what he had to say about the nation building investment and infrastructure in the recent budget. Or Heather Ridout, CEO of the Australian Industry Group. This spending, this spending on infrastructure Order. will be directly supportive of jobs. Or what about Trevor Martin of, of the Australian Trucking Association? He said this, Australia's truck drivers will be using the roads funded in the budget for many years into the future. Our journeys will be safer and faster with lower transport costs for business. And it goes on. An endorsement from the business community because they recognise they recognise the importance of economic stimulus, and of course those opposite do not. Now we know they don't have an alternative budget plan or fiscal policy. We heard nothing about it in the opposition leader's reply because they don't want to admit that they would not borrow one cent less or pay debt back one day one day earlier. They won't admit that because they want to go around the country and campaign against economic stimulus that creates jobs now into the future. They can't bring themselves to supporting this vital investment in our community. But I certainly take great heart from the fact that Australians right across this country understand the importance of economic stimulus, understand the importance of economic stimulus in local communities. And that's why governments borrow that's why they borrow responsibly to support jobs and to leave a lasting legacy for the nation. And that is what this government has done, and that is what those opposite are opposing. Yeah, yeah. The member for North Sydney. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to the Prime Minister's last answer today when he said that government net debt will be paid off in 2022. In order to now pay the debt off, the government would have to run record surpluses of more than 2 per cent of GDP for eight years straight. <laughs> Treasurer, when ever in the history of our country has a government done that? The Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, we know those opposite couldn't find savings in recent budgets 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, we on this side of the house, we on this side Order. of the house are up to the task Order. of making the savings in budgets. We made them in the last budget, and, we'll made them, and we've made them in this year's budget, Mr. Speaker. We are entirely up to the up to the mark in terms of charting a path back to surplus, Mr Speaker. Of course, those on the other side of the House went on an unsustaining, unsustainable spending spree at the height of a mining boom, and they spent like drunken sailors, Mr Speaker. And we know what they did because the member for Higgins blew the whistle. He blew the whistle in John Howard's biography, where he complained about the spending of the former Prime Minister and his inability to stop it. Well, what we will see from this side of the House, Mr Speaker, is fiscal discipline. Fiscal discipline, Mr Speaker, because we have put in place, we have put in place a, a spending cap of 2 per cent real, a spending Member cap of 2 per cent real when growth returns to trend. And that is why, that is why our objectives are entirely reasonable and achievable, Mr Speaker. And it's a bit rich when those on that side of the House Cannot front up Order. and to find any the alternative savings both in the budget. The Treasurer and the member for Dixon will um, resume their places. To assist the member for Dutton, if the point of order, the member for Dixon, I would indicate to the Treasurer that he should um, relate his remarks to, to the question. The Treasurer. Order the member for Dixon. Regrettably, the member for Dixon is now warned. Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Prime Minister indicated before, net debt as percent of GDP is expected to be 3.7% in 1920, charting the path back to surplus, Mr. Speaker, and paying down in 2015-16 and paying down the borrowings. Order. Because this government has been entirely responsible, entirely responsible in supporting the economy. In our, in our hour of need, Mr Speaker. This government has had the courage to support jobs through economic stimulus, to put in place a medium-term fiscal strategy and an expenditure cap to bring the budget back to surplus and to pay down debt. And if only those on the other side had the courage to front up to this parliament with an alternate budget policy or fiscal policy. They don't have that courage, Mr Speaker, because they want to play the scare campaign. They are so opportunistic and so Order. devoid, devoid of a commitment to the national interest. All Order. we get are these silly political Order games. Has the, Order. Has the, Treasurer, has the Treasurer concluded? The member for Dawson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, Order. Employment, Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on the impact that the Building the Education Revolution is having on jobs in local communities? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Dawson for his question. And I note that in the member for Dawson's electorate there are 216 projects that are being invested in through the government's economic stimulus. 201 of these are building the education revolution projects in local schools. And of course, the member for Dawson knows that that's great news for his local schools and great news for local jobs. He also knows, of course, that the Liberal Party is opposed to each and every one of those projects in his electorate, because the Liberals are all about talking the economy down while we build the nation up. Now, the member for Dawson would also know that the projects in his electorate are being joined by projects right around the country in almost 10,000 schools. And this is being well received right around the country. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, endorsements for this program have been flooding in. To take just one example, in the member for Gray's electorate, a primary school on the York Peninsula, where Nick Googe says, and I quote, this is seriously once in a lifetime stuff. It's a really exciting prospect for a little school. An endorsement about how important this is for local schools. But of course, this is also important for local jobs. 
Now, the Leader of the Opposition has been known to say that building the education revolution is a poor quality spend and that it won't support any jobs. Well, Australians in local communities know the truth, and the truth is building the education revolution is there supporting local jobs. To take one example, a report in The Australian on 8 May uh, reported in the following terms about the impact building the education revolution was having on architectural services. It says, and I quote, Within a week of the federal government's announcement of a $14.7 billion schools upgrade program, Law Architects had 10 new projects on its books worth $20 million. Not in their lifetime has the economy been so bad and business quite so good. And the uh, article goes on to quote Ms Law of the business who says, when the announcement came out we were leaping for joy and when the phones kept ringing we kept leaping. We are flat out. We haven't been this busy for many years. And another firm which specialises in building and uh, architecture for education facilities is in the process of hiring up to 12 architects in order to deal with the economic stimulus work. And given the National Party has been left in charge of the House today, uh, we might note in the member for Riverina's electorate that her local newspapers are noting that the Building the Education Revolution program is supporting local jobs. And there, one of her local newspapers reports that Lang O'Rourke will manage the overall project and its timeframes and has been inundated with applications from the local Department of Commerce, accredited builders, tradespeople and small businesses with school experience who want to play a role in the program. He's going to base teams in the local area in order to back this program. And then we've got the endorsement for the co from the contractor uh, responsible for overseeing the maintenance at uh, a school called Alexandria Park Community School. The, the head of that contractor says, and I quote, there is little doubt that several of those small, medium-sized businesses would not have survived the global financial crisis without benefiting from govern government infrastructure contracts. So whilst this evidence is clear from people in local communities who are in touch with what's happening in their community, on the other side of this House all we see is continued opportunism. And depending on the moment, they will blurt out whatever comes to their mind next. And in terms of blurting out whatever comes to their mind next, some days they blurt out debt and deficit. Some days they blurt out that they proudly voted no. Some days, like the member, some days the member for Gilmore and others are going thumbs up for local projects. Some days the member for Wentworth is trying to get himself in the local photograph. Uh, people obviously notice this opportunism, this cheap opportunism, and these inconsistencies. Order. And they're the members opposite in their embarrassment and shame because they didn't send hand up for Order. jobs the in their local Kalgoorlie. community are yelling out. But the Australian community knows the truth. This side of the House stands for building the education revolution. This side of the House stands for supporting local jobs. This side of the House stands for building the infrastructure we need for Member tomorrow. For Those opposite stand for talking the economy down and the sort of carping we've just seen, Mr Speaker. The member for North Sydney. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. <clears throat> I'll refer the Treasurer to his own budget papers. Budget paper number one, 10-6, uh, the table relating to the underlying cash balance. And I note since 1970, on only three occasions has the government delivered a surplus of 2 per cent or more—1970 and 1971, uh, some time ago, obviously, uh, Mr Speaker, and uh, 2 per cent in 2000. Does the Treasurer seriously believe that Australians will believe him when he says that to pay off the Rudd government debt, this government will deliver eight years straight of 2 per cent surpluses. The Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, the very, the very first point needs to be made that is I don't accept necessarily the premise of the question. I don't accept, I don't, I don't, I don't accept his, his assertions about Order. the levels of surplus whatsoever. I don't accept that at all. But what I do know is 
and this is something the previous government did not do, is that we have published more information on our medium-term fiscal strategy than any government prior to now. And we have done that. We have done that for a very serious purpose. We are in the middle of a 75-year, once in 75-year event, which has had a dramatic impact on this country. Order. The treasurer, the treasurer will resume his seat. Yet again, the member for Leichhardt. The member for North Sydney on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. It's relevant. I would ask the Treasurer to answer a simple order. question the for about North his Sydney. Prime Minister's own The members. member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The Treasurer will respond to the question. Treasurer. I am responding to the question, Mr. Speaker, because what has, what has occurred in this, uh, in this budget year is that taxation collections have dramatically fallen by $210 billion over the Ford estimates. $210 billion over the Ford estimates. There has been a dramatic collapse in taxation revenues. And the responsible course of action for a government in those, in those circumstances is to borrow, to support the economy, to support jobs and to support small business. And that is precisely what we are doing. And the responsible course of action in those circumstances is to chart a course back to surplus, to bring the budget back to surplus as soon as we possibly can, which is in 2015-16, and to pay down those borrowings. And that is the course that we have set out in the budget papers. And in addition to that, we've put in place some tight fiscal rules. And we have said, and we have said that what we will do, and we said this in UEFO, we said it in February this year, but it wasn't the subject of any questioning in this House at that time, that there would be a 2 per cent real cap on spending. We've said that, and we've said that because we have been prepared to take the courageous and decisive step to support employment in our economy, to support business, and we have had the support of the business community in doing that, because they recognise how important it is to borrow, to build infrastructure, the jobs for, the, for today and the jobs for tomorrow, they do understand the importance of investing in our educational facilities. To borrow to do that, to bring a benefit, a lasting benefit to our nation and to our children, they all understand that. The only people in the country who don't understand it are those opposite. We do have the support of the business community. We have the support of most responsible economists because they all understand that when revenues collapse, governments borrow to support their economy. And that is precisely what we are doing. And the levels of net debt here are low by world standards. Very, very low by world standards. We can afford to support our people, and we're doing that, and we're proud of it. But we also understand our responsibility to pay down those borrowings. We understand that totally, and which is why the budget papers contain so much information on our medium-term fiscal strategy. So our strategy is very simple, to bring the budget back to surplus in 2015-16 and reduce the levels of net debt to 3.7 per cent of GDP by 2019-20. Now that's a reasonable thing to do. It's a responsible course of action, and the only irresponsible course of action is the one taken by those opposite in this House today. The member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Will the Minister outline how the Government has expanded its Black Spots program as part of the Economic Stimulus Plan? How has this increased funding been received by local members and the community? The Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Flynn for his question. And indeed, in the Flynn electorate alone, 13 projects worth some $2.3 million have been approved under the Black Spots program as part of our stimulus plan. $100,000 to fix a black spot in Tannum Sands on Hampton Drive near St Francis Catholic School. A million dollars to fix a black spot on the Capricorn Highway in the small town of Comet. $60,000 to fix a black spot at the intersection of Falcon Street and Duck Street near the daycare centre in Longreach. Ten other, ten other projects in the electorate of Flynn, every one of them leading to support for local jobs, every one of them stimulating the local economy, and every one of them 
leading to an improvement in road safety for all the residents of Flynn and those who travel through the electorate of Flynn. Just some of one component of the stimulus package, which is delivering 412 projects for Flynn, worth some $65.7 million. The Black Spots program, of course, was increased to some $150 million by $150 million as part of the economic stimulus plan, meaning that over the next couple of years we're spending a quarter of a billion dollars, a quarter of a billion dollars on black spots, part of the 70 per cent of the economic stimulus plan that we're putting into infrastructure. This additional funding is delivering an additional 607 black spot projects around the country. Now, I'm asked also on how this has been received by local members and by the community. Well, of course, when the member, you can always rely upon the National Party. Always good for some material. Now, the member for Gippsland, when he was in Canberra, when he was in Canberra on the 26th of February, he said this. What I'm saying is the government has gone for a very low quality spending spree. We have seen a very low quality spend of taxpayers' money. Now, in accordance with that principle, he voted against the expansion of the Black Spots program. He voted against the Building the Education Revolution program. He voted against the regional and local community infrastructure program. He voted against all the measures in our stimulus package. So I was a bit surprised to look at yesterday's copy of the La Trobe Valley Express, where, where there's a lovely photo of uh, Mr. Chester, Mr. Chester at an intersection upgrade, at an intersection upgrade that he voted against, declaring declaring how terrific it is. In fact, speaking on behalf of the federal government. <laughs> speaking on behalf of the federal government. So I went to the website. I went to the website, Mr Order. Speaker. Order. Order. Dangerous roads to be upgraded, Chester. And in it, in it there's uh, two releases at least. He's gone through each of the ones outlining how terrific it is that the federal government is doing, is doing these projects and, and supporting the projects that he voted against. But he also says, he also says as part of those releases that, and I quote, he will continue to work with state and federal government ministers to secure more funding <laughs> to improve safety of local roads. Well, I'll give you the hint, brother. Just vote for it. Just vote for it. When it comes before these packages, just vote for it. Just sit on this side of the chamber and vote for the government. That would be a good start. But of course, the opportunism doesn't stop there when it comes to the National Party. Indeed, it's just beginning, Mr. Speaker. The member for Mallee put out a press release also, and he said this about black spot funding. This sort of essential infrastructure upgrade spending must be sustained in regional Australia despite economic recession. <laughs> Correct? Black spot funding goes to the heart of road safety. Correct? There's plenty more that needs to be spent, so I'm hopeful this black spot funding does not become a casualty of the May budget. <laughs> Listen to this, folks. Expenditure on economic infrastructure is the best way to generate sustainable jobs into the future. And then he goes through Order. the 20 Order. projects in Mali that he voted against. That he voted against. But there's more, Mr. Speaker. There's more. Although I'm, although I must say I'm not sure about this. I want to give the member for Maranoa the benefit of the doubt, because when I looked at these press releases welcoming our funding that he voted against, I looked at the date, Wednesday 1 April 2009. 
Given he voted against it, it might just be an April Fool's joke, Mr Speaker. But there he is, praising the green light for Kingaroy Road funding, praising the right move for Dalby Road funding. I table that release. I table that release. I table the releases from Mr Chester. I table the Latrobe Valley Express. I table the uh, media release from, from uh, the member for Mallee because it is quite clear. It is quite clear that when you look at why they say one thing in Canberra and something else in their electorate, is that they know that what they do here isn't fair income. Is not fair income. They know. They know that our economic stimulus package is not only good for their electorates, it is good for the nation. The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his own budget papers at 3-8, which says, Order. and I quote, that the underlying cash balance for the budget Order. The member for North Sydney will wait till those on my right come to order. Order. The member for North Sydney. His own budget papers, which state that the underlying cash balance of the budget will not reach 2 per cent by 2020. If that is the case, how is he going to meet his own Prime Minister's projection that the debt of the nation will be paid off just two years later? The Treasurer. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Well, well the first thing, uh, Mr Speaker, is that uh, the member from North Sydney is well known as Sloppy Joe, Mr Speaker. Order. And it's pretty rare. Order, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I accept that it was a very juvenile undergraduate term, but I would think that in the interest of trying to keep some sort of order in the House, you might order. like to ask the member to withdraw that comment. Order, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition will I would resume his seat. I'm in, I'm in the difficult uh, position of assessing whether uh, the member for North Sydney would find uh, this offensive, but given that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has indicated that he might, I will <laughs> order. I ask the Treasurer to withdraw the Treasurer. I just uh, will, will. Tre Treasurer. Order. Order. I've asked the Treasurer to withdraw. Oh, I withdraw, Mr Speaker. The Treasurer, thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, if the, uh, the member for North Sydney bothered to go to the budget papers and look closely at chart two on 3.8, he'd just see that the premise of his question is wrong. The yes. member for Kingston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. How is the government's commitment to build 20,000 new social housing dwellings supporting jobs? The Minister for Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Kingston for her question. Uh, she well knows that there are 132 projects underway in her electorate, and she's very supportive of those projects because they bring local jobs. They as well as building the infrastructure we need for tomorrow, they're providing the jobs we need today in electorates like hers, particularly in suburbs like Hallett Cove, Seaford and Woodcroft. And indeed, um, in the area of housing, there are 20 new homes being built in her electorate at a cost of $6.1 million in the first stage of the social housing stimulus package. Um, Mr Speaker, of course, if the Liberals had their way, not one single one of those 132 projects would be going ahead. Not the education, not the social housing, not the large infrastructure or the small grants there either. It's clear, Mr Speaker, that while we're building the economy up, the Liberals are talking it down. Constant negativity on the issue of jobs for the future. Mr Speaker, just three weeks ago I visited Hackham with the, the member for Kingston and saw the um, work about to commence on 16 Order. homes. 
Order. on 16 homes in her electorate. And while I was there, I spoke to Bradley Jansen, the managing director of Quattro, the company that's building these homes. Now, Quattro currently has 14 employees, but of course, uh, in the way that these building companies work, they have about 40 to 50 full-time equivalent contractors on their books at any one time. Prior to the announcement of the stimulus package, Quattro were considering laying people off. Uh, instead, when they heard about the stimulus package in social housing, they attended an information forum about that. They saw the opportunities for their business and, instead of laying people off, they're now putting people on. Indeed, they, they decided against redundancies that they had planned, and um, as well as, of course, this individual project that we're talking about, they say, Mr Jansen wrote to us and said, the social housing stimulus package, and I, I'm quoting now, gave us confidence to plan positively for the future. This confidence, coupled to responsible management, has helped us view this economic cycle as one of opportunity as opposed to one of doom and gloom. Thanks again to your team and the federal government for supporting our business, our staff and supplier subcontractor base. Now, Mr Speaker, it's well worth remembering that as well as this particular project of 16 homes, the, the investment that is provided through the stimulus package has unlocked um, equity that Quattro has. It's meant that they've been able to go right through their building supply chain. Projects that they had stalled because of the very tight finance environment will proceed because they've been able to, um, to do this deal with South Australian Housing to build these 16 homes. They say, and I quote, this has allowed us to plan for the reutilisation of the equity and profits on other projects on our books that are currently stalled due to tightened institutional funding. Mr Speaker, it's also worth saying that as well as putting on a, a new trainee just yesterday and uh, putting on a new contract manager in the next few weeks, that last week Quattro attended a local jobs summit that was organised by the member for Kingston. She's a very active member and indeed on the day that we were in her electorate she had, um, she had a, a, the, a fellow from the Hackham Business Association, a very nice man, Lloyd I think his name was, she, saw, she spotted him across the road and she said, Lloyd, Lloyd, come over and meet these people. Introduce them to Quattro, and Lloyd said, "Yeah, we've got a bricky up the road. We've got an electrician down here." Quattro have attended the local jobs summit in Kingston. They've been able to make connections with local tradespeople there and with local suppliers. So the flow-on effects of jobs in that area are, are supported by this investment in social housing. Mr. Speaker. It's also worth remembering that the Daily Telegraph have been reporting over the last two days about homelessness in Western Sydney and that as well as having these fantastic jobs benefit, the fact that we are building 20,000 new units of social housing, that we're fixing up 10, more than 10,000 homes that would have been lost as accommodation because of their poor state. 30,000 extra properties that way, another 50,000 properties through our National Rental Affordability Scheme. We're putting roofs over the heads of families who need to house their children, who need help at a time when they are particularly vulnerable. I would love to hear from the opposition. I would love to hear from them what their plan is to support these families that need a roof over the, the, the heads of their children. And I'd love to hear from them what their plans are to support jobs in construction. If they had a plan, they didn't enunciate it in the budget reply speech. They didn't enunciate it down there at the, at the press club when they could have not a word on homelessness, not a word on housing these people and not a word on construction jobs. The member for North Sydney. My question is again to the Treasurer, and I refer him to the page he just referred me to, where it says the budget is currently projected to return to surplus in 2015-2016. Treasurer, in order to meet his own Prime Minister's statement that net debt will be paid off by 2022, what will be the surpluses required each year, every year, to pay off that debt? The Treasurer. He's not, Mr. Speaker, he's not known for great attention to detail. We've seen that time and time again. There is a very, very simple answer. Order. You do not need Order. eight years, Joe. You don't need 
eight years Order. straight of 2 per cent surpluses. I look forward to seeing your figuring. I look forward to seeing your very accurate figuring. You don't need it. The member for Robertson. My, my Order question the member is to for the North Prime Sydney. Minister. Will the Prime Order. Minister? Order the House will come to order. The member for Robertson has the call. Order the Treasurer and the member for North Sydney. Will the Prime Treasurer. Minister outline for the House the importance in giving business the certainty it needs to play its part in reducing carbon pollution? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, it is uh, one hour and 16 minutes into question time and not a single question from those opposite on action on climate change. Not a single question on the topic which dominated the joint party room this morning amid such a celebration of party unity or cross-party unity as I've heard it described. Mr Speaker, what the Australian nation saw today was the leader of the opposition rolled in his own joint party room. Uh, what we saw today was, once again, as on work choices, so today on climate change, the leader of the opposition rolled by the ideological hard right wing of his own party and the National Party. Mr Speaker, the leader of the opposition came to the leadership of the Liberal Party uh, rolling his predecessor. Prime Minister, it, Prime Minister, Prime Minister assume his seat. The mem I appreciate that the Minister for Trade might be the member for Cowper's number one fan, but he cannot interject on him. The member for Cowper on a point of order. On relevance, Mr. Speaker, the question related to certainty on climate change. The <laughs> Prime Minister is responding to the question. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, the relevance to certainty on climate change goes to what happens in the Senate through the votes of the National Party and the Liberal Party. That's why this question is of direct relevance to business certainty, certainty on the actions to be taken at Copenhagen, actions which would be necessary to provide Australia with hope on acting on climate change, to help save the Barrier Reef, to help save Kakadu, to take necessary action for the future, and those opposite scoff at that possibility. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, Order. The leader of the opposition undertook a political campaign within the Liberal Party to roll his predecessor, with one of his causes being he would be strong on climate change. He accused his predecessor of being weak on climate change. That was the political attack. What happened today was that the Leader of the Opposition was rolled in the Liberal Party party room, <coughs> rolled in the joint party room, by the climate change sceptics. The self-proclaimed climate change champion rolled by the climate change sceptics. That's what happened on the part of those opposite. Let us go to what currently constitutes the position of those opposite. Given how intimidated the current the leader of the Liberal Swamp. Party is by the person who seeks Cowan. to replace him, that is the member for Higgins as leader of the Liberal Party. Remember in the joint party room, remember in the Liberal Party, the member for Higgins. Uh, the Prime Minister will assume his seat, the member for Cowper on a point of order. Relevance, Mr. Speaker. The minister, Prime Minister responding to the question. Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Remember the member for Higgins, who now comes to, uh, comes to consciousness, clad that he's mentioned in the chamber, so that he can participate fully in the debate. He did so in the joint party room some time ago when he said there's two things that. Prime Minister will assume his seat. The member for Canning Mr. on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, the point of order. Is relevance on any measure. The Prime Minister wasn't in the coalition party room, the so he would not know to be able to say this at all. Seat. The question went to the importance of business acting to reduce carbon pollution. The Prime Minister will respond to the question. The Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, because the dynamics of the Liberal Party party room and the joint uh, party room is of direct relevance to what happens in the Senate. And the reason we know what happens there is you leak it all out. That's why we all know, and we know it within an hour of it occurring. Well, I don't know. The, pro the member for Capital Regimes. The Prime Minister is responding to the question. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As my colleague said, there are in fact many omissions from those opposite when it comes to the way in which they leak from their own party room. The, uh, 
the uh, next uh, leader of the Liberal Party, the member Higgins, has gone out in the public record, or he said in the party room recently, two things they've got to do vote against or stand against action on climate change and support work choices. What have we seen in the most recent few months? Precisely that course of action being supported here in the chamber. The leadership of the current Leader of the Opposition has been fundamentally undermined by his inability to stand up to the climate change sceptics in his own party. And the reason those opposite are silent during this debate is they know it to be true. It's exactly what has transpired. Because let us, let us go to the current position of those opposite. The current position of those opposite, the member which for is Cowan. that action should be deferred on climate change pending wait for it another review another review let us let us quickly go to the evolving position of the liberal party on this question what did they say back in december last year in december 07 i should say the then spokesman uh, said that we will set both medium and long term targets after the ghana review the ghana review was on 30 september 2008 then they went on to say that we, well, we won't set any figures until we see the government's modelling. Treasury modelling was released on the 30th of October 2008. Then they said, we will look at what the government comes up with with its white paper and see what the Treasury modelling is when it comes out. Well, that was released on the 15th of December 2008. Then they said that they would take position after the Pierce report was delivered. That's their own internal inquiry. Well, the Pierce report apparently delivered its findings on the 30th of April 2009. Then we had the member for Goldstein say, well, we'll finally sort out our alternative once the Senate inquiry has been concluded. Well, the Senate inquiry, they've ensured, has been delayed until the 15th of June 2009. Then they say it's going to happen once we have a Productivity Commission inquiry. No fixed date. Mr Speaker, what you have here is a rolling series of excuses to underpin the fact that the Leader of the Opposition has not had the courage to take on the climate change sceptics in his own party. It is an absolute failure of leadership on his part, and he knows it. What Australia is looking for at present on climate change, what the business community is looking for on climate change, is certainty. They have called publicly for certainty. When you look at the statements by the Australian Industry Group, the statements by the Business Council of Australia, they want certainty for the future, and the Leader of the Opposition, in response to this call for business, for business certainty, has simply gone missing. When those in the broader Australian community want action at Copenhagen to provide Australia with some hope of appropriately helping to assist the protection of the Barrier Reef and Kakadu in the long term, the Leader of the Opposition has gone missing. All Australians wanted this Leader of the Opposition to stand up and to defy the climate change sceptics in his own party, but instead of acting in the national interest, he has acted in the narrow interest of the Liberal Party all the way through this. Mr Speaker, these those opposite I heard an in interjection say this represents a misrepresentation on our part. I have gone through seven reasons they have given in the last 12 months to prevent them from taking a final position on climate change and carbon pollution reduction, and those opposite say we are misrepresenting the facts. Those opposite had an opportunity in their party room today, most particularly Leader of the Opposition, to show some leadership, to stand up, to take a position to go out there and actually stand up for the national interest rather than to act purely in terms of the Leader of the Opposition's personal interest. The moral authority of the Leader of the Opposition on climate change and, more broadly, was shredded once and for all in the joint party room today. The member for Higgins, representing the next leadership of the Liberal Party, went in there a couple of months ago and said the Liberal Party cannot support this action on climate change, and what we saw today was the current Leader of the Opposition buckle to that pressure. Australia demands action in the national interest, and what we have seen instead is partisan, partisan action on the part of those opposite and an absolute failure of leadership and an undermining of the national interest. Order the member for North Sydney. I refer, my question is to the Treasurer again. I refer to his own budget papers, which say the budget is currently projected to return to surplus in 2015-16. Treasurer, I ask you again, what would the surpluses need to be between that year and when the Prime Minister has pledged to pay off the $203 billion of net debt by 2022? The Treasurer. Yes, I, uh, I, I thank uh, the member for his question because Sloppy Joe has changed tactics. Order. The uh, member will re re withdraw the remark that was asked to be withdrawn. I withdraw, Mr Speaker, because he asserted, 
He asserted in his earlier question that it would require surpluses in excess of 2 per cent of GDP. That's what he said. He's now, moved, he's now subtly crab walked away uh, from that assertion. Mr. Speaker. Now the budget indicates that net debt. Well, you have. You've walked away from your assertion. You pretended it would require surpluses of 2 per cent of GDP, and now you've walked away from it because it's simply not credible. Mr. Speaker, completely walked away from it. Mr. Speaker, those right. opposite are just acutely embarrassed by the fact, by the fact that they have been exposed to the Australian Order. people as not having an alternative fiscal policy, not a one. And that's what this questioning is all about. Order the Treasurer resume his seat. The member for Dixon on a point of Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, this cannot possibly be relevant. This order is the, the member worst for Dixon contribution will by Treasurer himself. in the a member country's for Dixon history. Will is a Order the member for North Sydney. The member for Dixon will leave the chamber for one hour under 94A. The Treasurer will respond to the question. Treasurer. Certainly, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, net debt as a percent of GDP is 3.7% in 1920, Mr. Speaker. And there were in 2019-20, Mr. Speaker. And there we go again. The juvenile games order. as a substitute for the fact the, there is not the one treasure, order, element of fiscal order, policy. The treasurer will ignore the interjections. Said. The interjections will cease. Treasurer, Mr. Speaker, and why are they so upset? Why are they so upset? 3.7 per cent of GDP. Order. Let's just have a look around the world at what the international comparisons are, Mr. Speaker. Order the Treasurer resume his seat. The member for North Sydney on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Treasurer can't hide his own budget numbers. Order the member for North Sydney he resume his reach seat. 2 per cent. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat, and he has the same warning that the member for Dixon received. Treasurer. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, earlier, earlier he was proposing that the figures were wrong. Now he's saying they're right. Which one is it? Which one is it, Joe? Very, very. Order sloppy. the member will refer Those to members by their titles and refer his remarks the to the chair. That the budget puts in place structural saves over the long term to pay down debt, to bring the budget back to surplus and to pay down debt. They are embarrassed by the fact that they have no structural savings whatsoever. And what we saw in the House for their budget reply was this fudge of the tobacco tax increase, which was somehow supposed to make up for the fact that they're going to oppose our means test of the private health insurance rebate. A fundamental save to bring the budget back to surplus and to pay down debt. And who's opposing it? All of those. So they're not serious about a, a serious medium-term fiscal policy, Mr Speaker. We have one, and they don't, and it's there for everybody to see. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Will the minister outline the importance of investment certainty in the transition to a low-carbon pollution future, and what has been the response to the government's proposed carbon pollution reduction scheme? The Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for Isaacs for the question. And the, the fact is, Mr Speaker, that certainty is absolutely critical to the business community and to the Australian community in determining what appropriate measures and actions should be taken to respond to the dangerous threat of climate change. And the fact is that action on delivering the necessary investment for clean technologies, for energy efficiencies, absolutely central to our efforts to reduce Australia's carbon pollution. And for that investment to take place, business needs certainty. The Prime Minister has just referred to that. The Business Council of Australia, the Australian Industry Group and others have made clear on many occasions how important, in terms of economic planning, certainty really is. Now, Mr Speaker, the government recognises this because we brought forward a carbon pollution reduction scheme for this parliament to consider. 
and we recognise it because we're bringing the largest ever rollout of a clean energy initiative seen in this country. And Mr. Speaker, I noticed today a statement by the Australian renewable energy company Pacific Hydro, who, in responding to a major financing deal that they've announced today in relation to Chile, said, and I quote, Australia will benefit from similar significant investment and job creation opportunities once the climate change and energy policies proposed by the Rudd government are put in place. Yeah. And Pacific Hydro went on to say, and I quote, we call on the Australian Parliament to ensure passage of both the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme CPRS, and the 20 per cent renewable energy target this year so we can set about the task of transforming our stationary energy sector into one that is substantially less carbon intensive and better able to compete on the world stage. Now, that was the message today from one of Australia's leading renewable energy companies. But what was the message that we got from the opposition? Well, Mr Speaker, what we've seen today is a comprehensive failure of the position that the Leader of the Opposition has held ever since he came into political life. And what's more, it's a, it's a position that shows that economic policy in the Opposition has been abrogated to the National Party. Now, Mr Speaker, the Opposition's position seems to be we aren't prepared to do anything, but we'll call for another report. Let's just see how long this has been going on. In 1997, the Environment Minister, Robert Hill, established an inquiry into emissions trading. In 1999, the Australian Greenhouse Office released four discussion papers on emissions trading. In 2002, the previous Prime Minister announced Australia would not ratify the Kyoto Protocol. In 2003, the then Treasurer and Environment Minister took a submission to Cabinet to establish an emissions trading scheme, only to see it vetoed. That was six years ago. Mr. Speaker, six years ago, six years ago, the opposition, when they were in government, were looking at an emissions trading scheme. And in fact, as the opposition leader said on late line on the 9th of July, the coalition's policy, the Howard government's policy last year, was that we would establish an emissions trading scheme system not later than 2012. And he went on to say, oh, this, will, "This will interest the member for Flinders. It was not conditional on international action. It was obviously done in the context of international action." Now. What has happened today, Mr Speaker, is this, that on one side of the opposition benches we have the National Party, who are sceptical about climate change and want to deny its impact and to delay it, and on the other side we have the Leader of the Opposition, who previously has held that climate change is an issue that needs to be addressed. But I couldn't help noticing, Mr Speaker, when the press releases came out today. Now, the press release by the Coalition then announced that the Coalition wants to be in touch with the rest of the world on this issue. And I thought to myself, why would that trouble the opposition when in government they were perfectly happy not to be, not to be in touch with the rest of the world on this particular issue? Well, well let, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that the member for Wide Bay, the leader of the Nationals, has made a timely intervention because it gives me the opportunity to respond to his comments about an emissions trading scheme, which, if I read them correctly in The Age, he said something to the effect of, it is a job-destroying, rabid dog scheme. So imagine the instructions that the leader of the opposition, imagine the instructions that the leader of the opposition gives to the Productivity Commission. I want you to consider the matter of an emissions trading scheme. Ignore the comments from my senior colleague that it's a job-destroying, rabid dog scheme. When you come to your views, I mean seriously, Mr. Speaker, that is where members of the opposition are at on this issue. And then we saw, and then we saw the release from. Uh, the national leaders in the Senate, Barnaby Joyce. Now, 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 Mr. Speaker, Senator Joyce has seen fit to actually put his views on the record and state with absolute crystal clarity what the nationals' position on an ETS is. It's got nothing to do with deferring. It's got nothing to do with referring matters to the Productivity Commission. It's got nothing to do with waiting for any more time to allow other countries to do what the opposition can't get its act together to think about what it wants to do. It's all to do with the fact that the National Party don't want one at all. And why do we know that? Because Senator Joyce says delay is a vote against the ETS. And then he goes on to say the goal of the nationals is to stop is to stop and i quote is to stop the scheme and utilize whatever mechanism it possibly can do to do that so mr speaker what we have today 
is a position that's come out of the party room of the opposition where economic and climate change policy is being determined by climate change deniers, agrarian socialists and hokey contrarians. And, Mr Speaker, <laughs> frankly, it is not good enough, and the opposition leader should show some leadership on this issue. The member for Macmillan. Order. The member for Macmillan has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister in her capacity as the Minister for Education and is particularly relevant to regional members like myself and my seat of Macmillan. What advice has the Minister received from her department as to how many young Australians currently in their gap year, currently in their gap year will be penalised by the government's changes to the eligibility criteria to the independent youth allowance? Yeah. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. And I can tell him very clearly what advice I've received. I've received advice that over a hundred thousand students will be better off. That is, 68,000 students Order. will receive income support Order. for the first time and 35,000 students will receive higher payments. What the changes to the parental income test mean <laughs> is that parents can earn more before they, their Order. children start to lose income support. And as a regional member, I think the regional member will be very interested in these statistics. The way the scheme currently works is that a student to receive the maximum away from home payment of $371.40 a fortnight, the income of their family has to be $32,800 or less. Now, under the new scheme, that threshold will increase to $42,559. And then we have changed the taper rate. The current taper rate is 25 per cent. The taper the taper now will be 20 per cent. Now, for the regional member, and I know he will be concerned about this because he will know about incomes in his electorate, under the Rudd government scheme, that means a family with university age kids, 19 years and 23 years, living away from home, can receive support up to a family income of $139,388. That's compared with a family income of $75,324 now. Now he would know as a regional Order. member Order. he would know as a regional member that Order. the uh, average Order. annual household wage and salary index uh, study shows us that in regional and rural areas we're talking on average about household incomes of 54,500. That is, on average, the constituents in his electorate fit into this scheme and will get student income support. That is, before we move to the question of the scholarships, we are having under our scheme. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. The question specifically asked for a figure, the number of students currently order. in their gap year the who will leader, in fact be disqualified the deputy leader from attending will resume university her seat. as a result of their The Deputy <laughs> Leader will resume her seat. I refer members to House of Representatives Practice, pages 552 that indicate, no matter how specific members think that the question is, that the Deputy Prime Minister is being relevant in some way or part to the question, and that has been held to be relevant under the standing orders. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This is a serious topic, and I'm treating the answer seriously. Uh, the Rudd government is also introducing student start-up scholarships. 1,000, 146,000 students will get Order. these. That's a major increase from the 12,900 scholarships available now. Uh, and we're introducing 14,200 new relocation scholarships. That is also a major increase on the number of relocation scholarships available now. Now, the uh, member also asked me about the uh, characterisation 
of who is independent Order. for student income Order. support. This Order. goes to the question of the Order. gap year, which was just raised with me. And I can say to the member this on the question of the gap year that he has raised and the uh, independence test for student income support, that the Bradley Review found that in relation to that test, income support was poorly targeted. It found, the Bradley Review, that 36 per cent of independent students living at home were from families with incomes over 100,000. 10 per cent in that situation were from families earning more than 150,000, and 10 per cent came from families over 200,000. Now, when I received that information from the Bradley Review, I was concerned about poor targeting, but I wasn't the only one. And let me just quote something to the member, which I think he will find very relevant. Let me quote the following advice I got along the way. If the government is serious about reform, then come budget time, we should seek some consideration given to reforms suggested by Bradley in student income support to ensure that sufficient support is going to those who need it. I accepted that advice. It came from the Shadow Minister for Education. The member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for oh. Health and Ageing. Order! Will the Minister... Order. The member for Hindmarsh will resume his seat. The member for Barara on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I sought, I sought your call to ask whether or not the Minister would table the advice, which I found very valuable. Order. Was the Deputy Prime Minister quoting a document? Uh, yes, I was. Was Mr. the Speaker. document confidential? It is confidential. The member for Hindmarsh. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Uh, will the Minister update the House on the government's plans to improve the health system for all Australians and of any other policy proposals? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Hindmarsh for this question. It's uh, nice to get a question on health. We uh, have been a number of days since the budget. We haven't had any serious questions from the opposition on health. We haven't had one on infrastructure. Uh, we had, haven't had one on family and community services. In fact, um, even when I stand up today, there doesn't appear to be a health spokesperson or an education spokesperson Order. even here in the chamber. But we Order. are determined. We are determined Order. to invest in health. It's why we, in our budget, are making historic investments in hospitals, in primary care, um, in <coughs> infrastructure, in a whole range of different areas. And the fact that every Australian can receive free treatment in a public hospital, no matter where they live or no matter what their income level, is something that Labor is absolutely committed to. It's why the government has invested more than 50 per cent more into our public hospitals than the previous government did in its last agreement. And it seems clear to me that the opposition is really struggling to come up with any alternative health policy. I can uh, imagine the Leader of the Opposition after the budget sitting perhaps down with uh, the member for Dixon, perhaps sharing a Bacardi breezer or something, uh, having a chat over Order. what sort of a response Order. they might make. And I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised that the member for Dixon didn't have any suggestions, and I imagine that the Leader of the Opposition might decide to call an elder statesman of the Liberal Party, put a call in to say, what sort of ideas do you have for our health policy? And I'm, I'm pretty sure that call was made, because shortly after we saw some comments coming out that seemed to be the formulation of health policy. We heard the member for Dixon exclaiming, and I quote, we need to get private patients out of public hospitals. Then we heard the Leader of the Opposition speaking fondly of his utopian vision that uh, every Australian would have private health insurance. And it seems to me that the view was becoming clearer and clearer about what the Liberal Party sees as a sensible health policy. Take money out of public hospitals, force everybody into private health insurance. I'm sure it won't be long until they're attacking Medicare. So you might, on this side of the House, be asking, who was it? Who was it that the Leader of the Opposition called in his hour of need? And I, I want to give the House a bit of a clue. It, it's an elder statesman in the Liberal Party, 
Uh, it is a person who's been in the parliament for a long time. He's a, a man of ideas. I know that does limit the people that it might be. Uh, a man of vision, so it does rule out the member for Higgins, in case anybody thought it was him. The Leader of the Opposition decided to call somebody with real policy gravitas. And I'd like to give you a quote uh, before I tell you who this person was. Listen to this interview conducted with the then Liberal Shadow Minister for Health. So the, in the interviewer says oh, the member for Cowan. simply so the proposal is to end the end of Medicare and for everyone to pay for private health insurance. The Shadow Minister, yes, no Medicare, yes, everybody to be privately insured. And, and who do you think the architect was? The true ideological grandfather? And of course, that's right. Malcolm would turn to the member for O'Connor for advice on health policy. Not just taking us decades back, but two decades back into Liberal Party thinking on health policy. No wonder, no wonder there have been no questions from the opposition on health after the budget. We are determined to invest in public hospitals. We are determined to support those who have private health insurance. We are determined to get the right balance and we expect the Leader of the Opposition to be prepared to do the same. He should recant on his view that every single Australian must have private health insurance, and he should start backing our investments in public hospitals so that every Australian can get their care in a public hospital free of charge if that's what they choose. Yeah. Prime Minister. Further questions be put on the notice paper. <laughs> Order. The Member for O'Connor. Thank you. Uh, I seek to make a personal explanation.